A few pages later, another moment like this occurs between Kyle and his father. As Kyle stands nervous and ready to walk down the aisle, his father asks, you okay, son? And then he offers a judgment. There's a lot of weird here, you know. This weird could mean a lot of things. This is, after all, a narrative about a marriage between a black human and a white mutant. <laughs> Correction, a mutant who can fly with a blue-haired creature serving as the minister. <laughs> like the guy between, these, between the frames, this phrase, there's a lot of weird here, you know, becomes a Falkirk line. The reader can make the narrative pivot in a number of directions. For me, in the context of a comic book about same-sex marriage, the open-endedness of this statement seems to imply that, even though Kyle and Northstar are performing a very normal ritual, there's still something not quite right about this situation. And here, Kyle, just like Northstar, has no argument. But if we zoom out one more step, it also becomes evident that these moments are just part of the larger function of this narrative to promote the not quite normalness of same-sex marriage in the US. This story takes place in present-day New York City, and by no coincidence, this comic book issue was released concurrent to the one-year anniversary of New York's Marriage Equality Act. And then, New York City's <laughs> mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who's a financial supporter of marriage equality campaigns, actually makes an appearance in the story. Additionally, the comic, the comic itself is part of a larger marketing campaign to promote the site specificity of same-sex marriage in the US. On the last page of the comic, this ad appears, and it walks the reader through a series of tips for getting married in New York City, including the dress code at the courthouse, <laughs> options for purchasing flowers, and that you or, and your, your soon-to-be spouse may be of the opposite or the same sex in New York. Here, inequality is used, and I'm sorry, inequality is acknowledged and used as a marketing tool to gain state revenue. So let me repeat that. Inequality is acknowledged. Two grooms on the cover of a comic book does not mean the same thing as an image of my grandparents on their wedding day. <coughs> Things that would be normally implied in this photo of grandma and grandpa are not necessarily implied for North Star and Kyle. But what happens when difference becomes invisible? In February of this year, when Fox News accidentally used this image of lesbian couple Stephanie Figarelli and Layla MacArthur in an online article that promoted the values of opposite sex marriage, three days later, social media took notice and laughter broke out. Fox removed the image. But why? Why remove an image that looks like traditional marriage? Why remove an image that seems to mean the same thing as opposite sex marriage? Because it doesn't mean the same thing. While marriage for opposite sex couples condenses visual recognition and legal benefits, under DOMA for same sex couples, this, this same equation doesn't work. Visual recognition is separate from legal benefits. This is a celebration separate from the system. This is love and not law. This is queer. This is possibility. This may soon disappear, but it hasn't yet. So now we have yes. So uh, now we have Jira Carrington presenting. Um, Jira is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico. She holds a BA in Psychology, 2004, and an MA in Applied Anthropology, 2007. Both the University of North Texas. Jira is currently working on a dissertation which focuses on the contemporary political movements for rights for binational. Thanks for coming today. Uh, immigration and same-sex marriage are at the forefront of intense public debates about national law in the United States. Binational same-sex or individual relationships are the crossroads of these two national controversies. Over the past several years, these have steadily gained uh, public and governmental attention, and they are now closer than ever to gaining state recognition and rights. In this paper, I first analyzed mainstream advocacy campaigns that call for rights for binational couples. Next, I turned to texts produced by individuals in binational relationships to discern the interconnection between mainstream advocacy 
in the ways in which white national peoples themselves utilize the discourse of family as they navigate the U.S. immigration system. White natural same-sex couples are prohibited from immigration benefits that heterosexual married couples access through a legal mechanism called family reunification. Family reunification has been an essential method by which immigrants have come to the United States despite restri restrictive immigration laws. Today, at the Council of Advocates for binational couples recognize the unique significance of family ties in immigration policy, and they have developed campaigns to argue for the inclusion of same-sex couples into the existing legal definition of family. Binational couples are generally portrayed in public discourse as long-term relationships in which partners are committed, monogamous, likely married with children, and are publicly out to family, friends, and colleagues. These characteristics are consolidated and legislative to be legalized by national Uniting American Families Act, or UAFA, stipulates that partners in binational relationships must be in financially interdependent, non incestuous, monogamous, intimate relationships with intentions for lifelong commitment. If the Immigration Service questions the nature of the couple's relationship, they can verify their status by documents such as the police's and the agency's, or One of the most publicized uh, advocacy campaigns refers to couples that have moved outside of the country in order to be with their uh, partner, and they refer to them as love exiles. This campaign uses a narrative of nationalist and romantic, but not sexual, desire, as it narrows the problems by national couples face. When a U.S. citizen moves outside the country in order to be with their partner, one advocacy organization cautions, quote, the U.S. loses the very fabric of our society, and its citizens who have so strongly believed in the ideals our country stands for lose their beliefs. Ironically, some Americans are forced to relocate to countries that are neither democracies nor tolerant of same-sex couples. Not only does the sentiment claim U.S. superiority over Canadian other tolerant but it also shows the lesbian or gay U.S. citizen is unproblematically invested in the dominant narratives of democracy and freedom that have underpinned contemporary U.S. military and economic interventions around the globe. This movie exemplifies what Joshua Pouar terms as homonationalism, an assemblage of discourses that allow for unfolding into the nation of appropriately gendered race and class homosexuals. Pouar uses homonationalism to describe processes in which the U.S. is positioned as exceptional in its acceptance of homosexuality, while the nations are pathologized for being lower on the chain of the world. This organization further cautions about the economic effects of love exiles. Quote, in addition to the loss an American citizen and his extended family may feel personally when he was forced to leave his country behind, he also leaves behind a full new American family. Every time that an American and his partner make a gut-wrenching decision to leave the U.S., our country is a contributing member of our society. This statement is a prime example of the way in which mainstream campaigns for rights for binational couples position individuals in these relationships necessary to the nation, as agents or actors, but rather as skilled laborers, conspicuous consumers, and employees who could simply move their labor as a commodity elsewhere. Ultimately, the urgency of immigration reform is expressed less as a concern of social justice, and more significantly, as a response to the United States' need for skilled labor and sustainable sources of revenue. Queer theorists and activists including Lauren Berlin, Lisa Dugan, Shannon Ray, and Yasmin Nair have discussed the ramifications of this type of advocacy and policy making in context within and beyond same-sex immigration rights. Here, we can utilize their insights to understand how this type of framing in this context places the potential for state recognition on a person's relationship or kinship ties and their economic capital. This forecloses any discussion of normative kinship ties as always already being race, class, and gender, exclusive of other persons who have formed alternate kinship ties. It also hinders a cogent critique of the economic incentives that have organized much of U.S. immigration policy historically and today. Further, by recognizing binational same-sex couples in the immigration context, the U.S. government is able to maintain its narrative of a liberal democracy while further disenfranchising and criminalizing those who are not as deserving of immigration relief, such as immigrants who are undocumented, those who have been convicted of a crime, or those who have worked without proper documentation. Analysis of public discourse about binational couples has demonstrated uh, interrogating, interrogating the complicity between homosexuality and nationalism is necessary to understand the discursive dynamics at play in a contemporary political moment. Queer theorists and activists have critically discerned the consequences of a politics that focus solely on inclusion in existing state institutions 
and their arguments are extremely relevant to my topic here. However, queer theoretical perspectives have focused largely on the operation of power on individuals and populations. I would like to shift the focus a little bit to question how lesbian, gay, queer, identified immigrants and citizens in binational relationships respond to, reflexively engage with, and sometimes push back on neoliberal state power. Queer migration scholar Ethan Lubey argues that legal status in the immigration context is, quote, contingent, unstable, and the outcome of multiple relations of power, including sexuality, which is often framed through a discourse of family, as it intersects with hierarchies of race, gender, class, and geopolitics. The speculative nature of legal status means that for binational same-sex couples, becoming legal is not one solitary occasion, but rather an ongoing process that can be circular and repetitious. The uniquely, the uniquely privileged position of family within U.S. immigration law conceivably offers a direct path to citizenship for some binational couples under certain circumstances. Individuals in these relationships understand this legal reality and utilize a variety of strategies in order to position themselves as potentially recognizable by the state as family. The result is that on the one hand, mainstream advocacy tactics and the resulting legislative address in the form of UAFA compel binational couples to place their hopes for a more permanent legality on the relationship and to shift that relationship, or at least its public face, to a heteronormative state approvable model. But on the other hand, an analysis of public text produced by individuals in binational same-sex relationships can help us to understand how individuals reflexively engage with and assume agency in this process in various ways. So supplementing mainstream advocacy campaigns, binational same-sex couples have increasingly utilized technological, artistic, literary, and performative media to tell their own stories as a means to call for state recognition and rights. In many of these texts, family is used as a framing device to point to a subjectivity that can be easily recognized by the state. This framing accomplishes multiple tasks. Clearly, it does the normative work of positioning oneself and one's family as like federal families do, and therefore capable of good citizenship and deserving of legality. However, the use of, these of family in these productions also marshals state recognition kinship state recognized kinship patterns as a means to connect other structural inequalities and discriminations that individuals face outside of their relationship with each other. These performances ultimately highlight the connections many binational couples see between gaining rights through state recognition of their relationship as family, becoming legal or full citizens, and access to other rights. That is, these public performances illuminate how individuals and binational same-sex relationships invoke a normative discourse of family to position themselves as desiring of U.S. citizenship and to highlight the discrepancies they face in U.S. law. I think we can agree this can be problematic when it enters this public sphere and works to reinforce homonationalist rhetorics and policies. However, when couples talk about the right to family recognition, rarely are they referring simply to the right to be with each other, and I would suggest that perhaps these performances do something else, too. These productions utilize the rhetoric of family to connect a variety of structural discriminations that couples experience, such as access to health care, education, employment, opportunity to continue relationships with or care for extended family, biological and non, and ontological security. <clears throat> Due to time considerations, I'll offer one brief example. U.S. Citizen, uh, US citizen Inger uses an online platform. utilize an normative discourse of family, but it also demonstrates how this, course of, how this discourse is marshaled in a manner that connects various inequalities produced by law. Here, immigration restriction, state-sponsored discrimination against LGBT. This interrelatedness points to a number of tensions, including the rhetoric of tradition, the limits of sovereignty, histories of regulation, and appeals to belonging. I narrow my scope today to focus on tradition and the temporality of settler colonialism. I argue that progressive politics grounded in liberalism 
have shaped both the mainstream and Native U.S. in a way that positions Native nations as regressively backward and have also reinforced the ongoing project of settler colonialism by locating certain practices and peoples safely in the past. The legal debate over same-sex marriage in the Cherokee Nation was prompted by the union between two women, Kathy Reynolds and Donna Kinley, and their case has garnered the involvement of others, all with differing states in the issue. Today I look at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, or NCLR, which serves as counsel for the couple. Cherokee anthropologist Brian Gilly, and the Cherokee Tribunal Council, in addition, of course, to Reynolds and McKinley. I'll present the different positions and strategies coming from these people and groups in order to parse out the terms of the debate. So, according to the public narrative presented in media interviews and court documents, the impetus for Reynolds and McKinley's case began in 2004 when McKinley was barred from visiting Reynolds' hospital room as the two weren't deemed family by the hospital. Deciding they needed more rights as a couple, they applied for and received a marriage license from the Cherokee Nation. They got married, but were then unable to file their license. Todd Hembry, an attorney for the Cherokee Tribal Council, who was in this moment technically acting as a private citizen, had challenged the validity of the marriage. In the time between these two events, the Tribal Council had unanimously approved a constitutional amendment defining marriage as between a man and a woman. Since then, however, there have been multiple wins for the couple. First, in August of 2005, the Judicial, uh, the Judicial Appeals Tribunal of the Cherokee Nation rejected Henry's petition to block the marriage, arguing that he lacked standing to bring a suit against the couple. Second, in December of 2005, the tribunal also rejected an attempt by tribal council members to invalidate the couple's marriage quote, because the council members cannot show that they were individually harmed or affected by the marriage in any way. Finally, a third suit was brought against the couple in 2006 by the Cherokee court administrator, but the Cherokee court once again ruled in favor of the couple. Following these three decisions, Reynolds and McKinley's have decided not to file their marriage certificate or pursue any other legal action in the Cherokee courts, which I believe is because the couple was split up. So, building on that case, um, today I focus specifically on the discursive function of tradition and the temporal distinction between past and present. I argue that Native traditions of two-spirit identities, while used as, quote, proof for the legitimacy of Cherokee same-sex marriage by the couple's representation and other supporters, are relegated to the past, while contemporary Cherokees, specifically Reynolds and McKinley, are discursively constructed as liberal, mainstream LGBT individuals, thus aligned with national LGBT rights activism. This distinction functions within the larger context of settler colonialism, in which, quote, a logic of elimination necessitates the disappearance, physically, culturally, and the intersection thereof, of Native peoples in order for the land to appear fully settled. So this is a common theory in settler colonialism um, coming from Patrick. So therefore, I attempt to bring homonationalism into the context of settler colonialism to begin to expose how Native queers have been incorporated into the mainstream struggle for same-sex marriage in a way that relies on a logic of colonialism and Native genocide. This is a little bit of background. Um, throughout history and into today, a heteronormative colonial logic has enforced Western values and practices on Native peoples in the U.S., leading to an obscuring and possible erasing of previous ways of life. Andrea Smith describes this as a process of internalization, arguing that through U.S. colonialism, Native peoples have internalized things such as self-hatred, patriarchy, and patterns of violence, which have manifested in the rhetoric of tradition. Tradition then takes multiple forms, with different people turning to various sources or periods of time from which to draw their understanding of its meaning. While this can be benign, there can also be more harmful constructions of tradition, such as Smith's example in which sexual violence in Native communities is depicted as traditional in order to justify its occurrence. As critical Native studies scholars such as Jennifer Dennettdale and Joanne Barker have argued, Rhetorical uses of tradition have been used to affirm Western ideas and deny the existence of respect and acceptance in Native cultures. 
Drawing on tradition to justify inequality and discrimination relies on a likely false understanding of tradition and furthermore serves to obscure the reality of present day sexism and homophobia. Turning to, to, turning to specific uses of tradition in Reynolds and McKinley's trial in the Cherokee Nation, briefs have been filed with the court that argue that same sex marriage is, quote, inconsistent with Cherokee Nation culture, heritage, and tradition. On the other side of the debate, Brian Gilly has submitted an affidavit in support of Reynolds and McKinley in which he states that, quote, there is overwhelming evidence for the historic and cultural presence of multiple gender roles and same-sex marriage relations among most, if not all, Native North Americans, including the Cherokee, and they historically shared in the institution. There are many other examples of similar uses of tradition in various sources surrounding the case as well. Each of these instances points to a, de a definition of Cherokee tradition, arguing that because practices happened in a certain way in the past, their continuation is justified. Those who support tradition, those who use tradition to support same-sex marriage in the Cherokee Nation draw on the concept of two-spirit to locate gender and sexual non-normative practices in the past. In the Cherokee case, Gilly references this history in his affidavit as well. So it also states that, quote, gender and for that matter marriage were traditionally seen by Native Americans in complex, sometimes fluid ways that bear little resemblance to the binary biological categories favored by Westerners. Your gender was traditionally determined by a person's role in a community, not your biological sex. Although Gilly doesn't use the term two-spirit explicitly here, his characterization directly refers to the way scholars and activists define it as evidence in his own scholarly book, which is titled The Coming Two-Spirit. So contrasting with this history and tradition that is being used as evidence for proper practices and laws today, the couple itself is, a, is discursively positioned squarely within the terms of mainstream LGBT rights rhetoric. The narrative of Reynolds and McKinley's case, coming from both the couple and their various legal representation, is that they simply wanted the same rights as any other couple. In interviews, McKinley was, has repeatedly clarified that she and Reynolds are not activists. The strategy of the case is not to question the validity of laws that prevent the marriage of same-sex couples, or even to argue against a law that is discriminatory against gays and lesbians both of which would still fall within the contours of mainstream LGBT rights activism. Instead, the case is depicted as one couple simply fighting for its own individual, individual rights, and this even though there is the larger potential that the dismissal of their case could lead to the legalization of same-sex marriage in the Cherokee Nation. As an example, commenting on an initial victory of the case in 2005, the NCLR attorney representing the couple stated, quote, Permitting same-sex couples to marry does not individually harm or affect other people. The court's ruling protects people's right to conduct their lives in privacy and peace without being called into court by third parties who have no relationship to them and no direct interest in the matter being litigated. We hear similar LGBT rights talking points in Reynolds' response to the December 2005 ruling in her favor, in which she stated, quote, Don and I are private people. We simply wish to live, live our lives in peace and quiet, just as other married couples are permitted to do. We are grateful to the court for applying the law fairly and for protecting our privacy and our rights as equal citizens of the charity. Reynolds avoids advocating for her right to be part of a same-sex marriage in any sort of public way. She is fighting for a private enactment of equality, one that would take shape within the space of hospital rooms or perhaps wills and adoption, aspects of life that are related to the domestic spirit. As McKinley stated before the first ruling, quote, we don't bother anyone, we mind our own business, stick to ourselves. How could our marriage hurt anyone? This overriding strategy then places the issue on the level of individuals in this HRC style strategy that is designed to be as unintimidating to the general public as possible. 
The proliferation and the proliferation and enforcement of values such as individualism and privacy place the couple within the framework of LGBT rights activism. Their lawyers have defaulted to normative liberal ideologies that, in addition to ultimately aligning with heteronormative values and thus excluding many queers and two-spirit folks from the benefits of their potential victory, also helps constitute the process of settler colonialism by discursively distinguishing between past traditions and present-day positionalities or identities. By working within the current possible strategies of achieving same-sex marriage rights, Reynolds and McKinley are, in effect, arguing to be incorporated into the mainstream of the United States. Notably and importantly, Reynolds and McKinley are discursively placed in distinction to the Cherokee Nation through contradicting discourses of tradition. Even though the women themselves are not claiming a two-spirit identity, the media and the couple's legal team have partially placed them in this tradition of native two-spirit gender and sexual fluidity. Therefore, the couple has been folded into the U.S. national body in part because of this past, while at the same time, the Cherokee Nation has been constructed as regressively backward. Mainstream U.S. is able to support the couple, which can most clearly be seen through their representation by the NCLR, which is the national organization, um, while simultaneously otherizing the Cherokee Nation as a whole and perhaps in light of the Navajo Nations and other tribes similarly timed bans on same-sex marriage, all contemporary Native peoples as a whole. In this specific context, the interplay between tradition and liberalism adds a more nuanced and explicitly colonial perspective to the notion of U.S. sexual exceptionalism. So here's how the leftist discourse surrounding the case goes. Native tribes have had a long history of gender and sexual fluidity. However, Native peoples have purportedly often become homophobic through processes of colonialism and Western cultural influence. Therefore, as Gilead stated, quote, what many Cherokees in this instance have failed to recognize, and what is often the case with Native peoples, is that the things they are calling traditional values are things that came about through interactions with Euro-Americans. And furthermore, through this narrative, Reynolds and McKinley's marriage should be recognized by the Cherokee Nation if they are to stay true to their traditions. Gilly echoes Andrea Smith's argument that I have outlined above, but what I want to point out here is that by asserting that Cherokees have, quote, failed to recognize their misunderstanding of tradition, while this couple has somehow been able to recognize this as evidenced by their adherence to mainstream U.S. liberalism, the message is that proper manifestations of tradition takes, take, take the shape of mainstream liberalism. In the case of same-sex marriage in the Cherokee Nation, then, U.S. sexual exceptionalism can be read as a colonial tool that follows the logic of settler colonialism. Although purportedly espousing a recognition of and respect for two-spirit peoples, through the terms of Reynolds and McKinley's case, we can see that in reality, only heteronormative notions of gender and sexuality are given recognition and legitimacy within the U.S. nation state. Two-spirit identities are discursively relegated to history and tradition, while liberal same-sex marriage rights are depicted as the modern manifestation of the past, despite, of course, two-spirit being a contemporary. Thus, Native peoples who follow mainstream heteronormative scripts are folded into the U.S. nation once their Native culture has safely been secured in the past. While those, quote, conservative Native peoples who are unable to get over the heteronormative patriarchal effects of colonialism are positioned as backward and not yet includable in the U.S. nation. To highlight this again, Native peoples are discursively produced as regressively conservative, or in other words, disavowing their accepting an open-minded past in order to embrace a conservative moralism. And this is sort of in distinction to other peoples of color and immigrant groups that are not depicted as regressively conservative, but just as always conservative. Relating this back to homonationalism more directly, for Native peoples, belonging to the U.S. national body entails a cultural erasure, supplanting a real inclusion of two-spirit identities with liberal gay rights rhetoric, and a simultaneous censure of Native communities as a whole that are seen as deeply, unchangeably homophobic. 
Therefore, the folding in of heteronormative native queers is dependent on the exclusion of another group, in this case, quote, conservative native peoples. Reynolds and McKinley, in a way, serve as a model for the way native peoples should progress. <laughs> by being just like Ellen and Portia, <laughs> though maybe with a little less candor. Thank you so much, Jessica. <laughs> But not least, um, we have Kurt Grisham, who is a staff associate at the um, Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. He works on multiple projects, but primarily serves as the project director of the UNE study, a study of same-sex male couples. He's also pursuing a master of public health part-time. Kurt focuses his writing, advocacy, and exploration on health, education, and welfare. And he, and he has a particular interest in the ways we conceive of risk vis-a-vis -vis race, technology, and citizenship. Kirk's goal is to pursue a doctoral degree in medical anthropology after completing his MPH. Okay, thank you guys for having me here. I'm sorry, I just have to pull up my, um, a couple of my slides from my presentation that I obviously did not get here on time. Um, but I want to thank you for coming, and I'm, it was nice to hear everybody's present, um, presentations and talks, and I look forward to our discussion after this. Um, I actually went to Queens College, so even though I'm at Columbia now, um, I actually find more identification with the community system, so please don't judge me as an Ivy Leaguer. <laughs> Here we go. So I think you guys, um, obviously, and I think I know you guys came here expecting for me to talk about um, homonationalism and dyads and queer resistance to that. However, um, I'm going to depart from that a little bit. Um, due to some of kind of my just kind of intellectual investigation and also what I kind of saw in the data. Um, that divergence is from the title and also the subject topic, but um, it's going to focus on an equally su substantive topic that I believe will investigate, challenge, and critique the ways in which we think about public health strategies and practices in relation to couples or men in intimate relationships. I, be I began with an interest in exploring the ways in which men in intimate relationships um, utilize state-based resources. And uh, this also kind of, I was thinking commonly about with a relatively strict sense about how I define the state. Um, I was influenced by critiques of homonormativity and homonationalism. I found myself restricted to using marriage or welfare services as a lens through which I imagined the state and the ways in which couples interacted with it. I then realized in order to gain a deeper understanding of this topic, I wanted to take a step back. I will tell you that the approach I, um, that I took after I give you a bit of background on the study from which we draw these findings and some background on why we are doing couples work in the first place. Um, the current study is part of a larger project titled the You and Me Studies that, that is exploring the, um, the relationship of power and HIV risk in same-sex male couples in order to gain a better understanding of the ways in which partner characteristics such as race, HIV, age, um, and education status, class, shape power dynamics among couples. While power is not the focus of the current study, the study generated a rich qualitative data set that we will use for our discussion today. Um, the qualitative phase of the study consisted of 48 same-sex male couples in New York and San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco, much broader areas. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the study set out to explore power dynamics in same-sex male couples, and the study is currently in our second phase. Um, of quantitative data collection. So hopefully actually there will be some, um, some ways to quantify empirically some of the talks we're having, some of the discussion today. Um, we explore these dynamics among black, white, and interracial black, white male couples. Um, eligibility depended on a relationship length of at least six months, or at least one partner reported having anal sex in the past three. Partners were interviewed simultaneously and separately and were asked questions regarding their individual relationship histories, individual and personal and sexual histories, and described things like decision making, um, as well as more kind of subtle experiences with racism, homophobia, interpersonal violence, and other domains. Um, part of the reason that we're doing couples research is the majority of new affections are actually occurring among 
same-sex male couple in the United States, um, and white and black men make up the largest groups um, of incident infections, respect, um, respectively. Um, MSM are the only demographic, and MSM means many what sex is I'm going to use that as an initial moving forward. Um, MSM are the only group in the United States where HIV infections have been consistently rising for the past 20 years. Um, and we actually see higher incidence among black MSM relative to white, but this is kind of something that we're still exploring the research and why this is happening, because most analyses show that black MSM are actually less, um, behaving in less risk behavior than white MSM. Um, and that's, so this is also a reason why kind of we want to look at um, race across couples. Um, between 2006 and 2009, HIV infections rose among black MSM, particularly young black MSM, 48%. Um, most interventions have focused on individuals. And so couples data provides us kind of a unique way to think about that, um, think about the ways that men approach relationships. Um, no studies yet have sought to understand how race influences relationship dynamics. And <clears throat> in exploring, um, in the studies that have existed to explore racial preferences of MSM, um, data suggests that black men are less desired than other men and are considered riskier sexual partners. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly it's a plethora of behavior, a ple plethora of data that suggests high incidence and prevalence among black MSM, which contributes to these perceptions. However, research has not examined the influence of these perceptions on how men choose primary partners or how these perceptions influence risk behavior within relationships. <clears throat> Some data suggests that HIV-negative white men are more likely to engage in UAI and to endorse serosorting beliefs. Um, this is, for example, when a couple is serosorting, one partner is negative, the other is positive, they're more likely to say have um, the HIV-positive partner be the receptive partner, which is technically more, lower risk. Um, other research have focused on personal responsibility, stigma, race and class, and sexuality, and how that impacts HIV prevention efforts among black MSM. These authors have found that black men in the sample expressed a need to take more seriously and to take more personal responsibility for themselves and their communities. Taken together, these studies suggest potential different ways in the, in the ways in which black and white MSM implement HIV prevention strategies in their relationships. Considering the literature and our data, I began to ask questions around how men enter and maintain relationships in an era of HIV and other increasing threats to health, and think about the purported benefits of relationships vis-a-vis -vis homonormativity. In thinking about public health and state responses to HIV, interventions around sexual risk are often aimed at reducing the number of sexual partners. The logic behind this is that HIV risk can be lower among men with fewer partners. This finding is validated in contemporary public health literature and meta-analyses. And indeed, this approach has been a chief aspect of public health provision with men who have sex with men. Accordingly, many have critiqued this as policing of sex and bodies. But objectively, returning to the idea of what public health is um, purported to do as a project of the state, it sets out to reduce risk, albeit often through surveillance, regulation, and control. So I now specifically ask, what are the ways in which regulation and management of HIV risk manifest in couples? Or couples of a certain race, zero status, or socioeconomic context more likely to perceive higher risk for HIV than others? And how does that relate to homonormativity and homonationalism? And finally, what accounts for the disproportionate allocation of embodiment of risk among men in intimate relationships? So for this discussion, it's necessary to think more broadly and examine how, examine how <clears throat> Uh, couples embody or disembody discourse around gay rights in this country, and further to consider sexual and health rights as sanctioned not only by the state, but also by social institutions like the family, um, community networks, religion, schools, and interpersonal relations, such as the dyad, or we call the dyad, dyadic, the couple. Um, that can provide both positive and negative support in the context of a shrinking state and retracting economy. We found evidence for the importance of examining this in our sample when we looked at sources of social and material support and found that many of the couples li living within a marginalized socioeconomic context, family or other networks were unable to provide support because of scarcity, lack of wanting, or even the rejection by their kin. This in turn pushed men towards the reliance on the dyad, the couple, for a means of su survival. This was not necessarily a novel finding and has generally been shown in literature that kinship um, showed in literature on kinship and economic survival for decades. Um, you know, think about Carol Stack's All in Our Kin, and that was in the 1970s. Um, what was interesting that emerged in our sample was what seemed to be a disproportionate distribution of perceived risk among certain men in our sample um, in intimate relationships versus other. 
Black MSM described consistent condom use with primary and outside partners, and that is to say they were diligent in their HIV prevention efforts, but still perceived themselves to be highly vulnerable and expressed fear of contracting HIV from sex with their primary partners. Some men expressed a sense of fatalism regarding their chances for becoming infected, even when their behaviors described lower risk. This finding was evidenced across black MSM and monogamous and open relationships, as well as in HIV negative and H concordant HIV status discordant relationships. Fear of contracting HIV did not seem to reflect relative reported risk behavior. Black MSM dating men of the same race reported greater fear and more diligent condom use and higher rates of testing than their white counterparts, regardless of HIV status and relationship outcomes, relationship openness. Black MSM dating white MSM in which both partners were negative appeared to have less fear and were more likely to develop agreements to not use condoms. Among the black MSM in our sample, having a black partner appeared to be more strongly related to the fear of contracting HIV compared to having an HIV positive partner. So now I'm thinking about kind of how HIV and incidence and perceived risk evidence themselves um, to be interesting points of entry for exploring the ways in which homonormative and homonationalist discourses are reified and manifest themselves in the social, material, and bio biomedical lives of men who have sex with men. Moreover, risk and the perception of risk highlight the racial embeddedness um, or racialization of these discourses and provide empirical markers for conceiving these very discourses and how they affect what we consider non-normative gay bodies. This discussion suggests returning to empirical inquiry and an exploration of sexual and health rights outside the popular marriage and healthcare provision discourse. By exploring these issues, we can see how discussions of sexual rights contribute to broadening our understanding of homonormativity when we consider race as a cross-cutting determinant of both epidemiological and social risk. What pushes me towards this reframing of rights in the state is austerity itself. Austerity and austerity, austerity measures produce result in a push us towards an anemic welfare state during times of economic protection. So I'm thinking about what, how do we think about our discourses regarding and understanding state power? Does, does austerity and neoliberalism at large also suggest we reconsider the ways in which we imagine and measure the state and its power and its effect on men and relationships? And what does this mimetic of state power and the discourse, discourse regarding the contextualization of that power have to do with risk? Our data demonstrated an unequal representation of the embodiment of risk that mirrors risk more that, rear, um, that mirrors prevalence and incidence more generally. It is concomitant with the material and social codependence that forms in diets that themselves contribute and lead to the perception of risk and powerlessness in the context of HIV. That is to say, people are using condoms but still feeling at risk. I'm now going to try to tie homonormativity, neoliberalism, and austerity with the following argument as a way to understand our findings. Distribu distribution of HIV prevalence across the U.S. among MSM and relationships is a product of that very homonormalization when considering sexual health rights as a marker, and not just considering, I'm sorry, let me back up, is a product of homonormalization when considering sexual health rights as a marker, and additionally, the embodiment and perceived need to manage the risk of HIV is a product of austerity. In a retracting political economy, the aims of the state are transferred onto those it sets out to manage. Black MSM and relationships become casualties of those very mimetics of risk, risk perception, and disease. Um, I am now going to actually stop. I know I kind of read kind of quick, but I think this will be a good time for us to open up some discussion and hear from the audience and talk about the rest of the presentations. Um, I do want to oh, provide this last slide. Um, the slides I left up on were kind of quotes from the study, and some of these were kind of the most salient in which um, couples were talking about <clears throat> kind of getting tested all the time, particularly black couples were getting tested. Um, they weren't necessarily receiving primary care, so there isn't like an argument around access here, but they were getting tested, they were using condoms, there was trust, there was monogamy. However, the black couples still were perceived a kind of greater um, sense of, you know, condoms not working, risk prevention behaviors not working, that we did not see in um, the white counterparts. Um, I want to acknowledge the team that I work with um, of the investigators, um, particularly Patrick Wilson, who is um, the principal investigator at Columbia, Sherry Dworkin, um, Torsten Neelands, Colleen Hoff in San Francisco, as well as the research team. And I also want to thank some of my friends and colleagues who helped me kind of push through some of these thoughts. One of them who is right here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
timely and very important discussion. And just to recap very, very quickly, um, we started with Amanda, who really wants us to think critically about the proliferation of images of same-sex marriage in the contemporary social and political landscape of the U.S. Uh, that was followed by Jessica's very interesting discussion of same-sex marriage in the Cherokee Nation and this role, this idea of temporality and how the sort of heteronormative liberal same-sex rights uh, becomes see, is seen as contemporary, whereas um, the identity of, of being too spirited is seen as part of history or tradition, um, even though it is quite contemporary. Uh, so that was really interesting. Jira um, had a wonderful intervention on uh, binational same-sex couples and the discourse of the family, but also I think it was a very nuanced discussion because it helps, you know, when we think about homonationalism, also to think about what happens when one partner is not a U.S. citizen and what happens now when there's a project of, you know, making the person quote-unquote legal and enfranchising that individual, perhaps, um, you know, that complicates the picture much, much more. And then finally, Kirk's discussion was very interesting. Um, I think it's... The, the questions are very provocative and compelling, trying to examine the intersection between um, practice as a public health practitioner, um, experiences with HIV, men who have sex with men, perceptions of risk, race, um, economic conditions, and the role of the state. So as an anthropologist, I did find that to be <laughs> ambitious. Uh, and, and I am sort of curious to hear more in terms of ethnography and actually how this manifests in terms of the lived experience and how people make meaning in their lives. But I understand that public health they want empirical data. Mm -hmm. So so this I think will be an interesting discussion. Perhaps I'll just open with one question and then we'll open it up. I'm just curious to hear from the panelists about what you think of or envision as the objective of this conference in general and how you see your specific intervention in relation to this conference um, about home nationalism and people. Yes, I it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> if Amanda, like if Amanda, if Amanda's ready, you can go first. <laughs> um, so from, from my perspective, I think the objective of the conference is to open us up to thinking critically about what's happening uh, in the political landscape, also in the academic landscape, and the role of neoliberalism sort of as an umbrella over all of this. Um, how I fit in, I think, is, is providing a, a different perspective um, because I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in visual more so than like the academic side of it and what the visuals do to us because I think that's a more insidious thing because it you know it, it, it goes through through channels that um, are not just academic channels I mean this is, this is mainstream this is pop culture um, so I think that's that's what I'm in. I would agree with what you said about the kind of goal of the conference as well as, you know, to think about maybe how in our own academic and political activist work these, these theories work or don't work for us, I mean, in a sense. Um, and so that was kind of one of my interventions that I think I was trying to make was, was I think it's really useful to think about homo nationalism, particularly from, from my research, um, when you're talking about kind of discourse on like a, on a broad scale, but when you look at actual the human lives, like what what does that do for us? How can we use these theories to understand the way the power works? And, uh, I was trying to kind of say that you know sometimes I think we can look at it as a very like one directional process, and then maybe there's some pushback and some reflexivity happening. Um, and I guess my objective is to the conference along with a few other Native Studies scholars that have been around, um, is to kind of look at what, how settler colonialism challenges and kind of reframes homo nationalism and what homo nationalism might be obscuring um, in the terms that it has been originally laid out. Um, and I mean, one example, not a conference goer, but Jody Bird has done like a really lovely job of looking at some very specific examples that Bouart brings out in uh, in her book, looking at homo nationalism and how that work that she's doing is ignoring like very clear examples of native peoples and issues of settler colonialism even within that critique. So 
Um, yeah, I mean, something that I'm still attempting to do with this kind of this particular project and couples work more generally in, and really, I know it's, it's, it's a lot to think about sexuality and health, um, and, but really kind of, I can't really separate homonormativity from neoliberalism. I think they were actually conceived of in the same thing. So, um, if I think about kind of the advancement and the less kind of state, re state regulation of some bodies, I mean, we can talk about marriage, but there's also a lot beyond marriage. Um, we, if we think about each of the race and risk, I think it's a really interesting example of kind of thinking about the advancement of some gay bodies versus others um, and kind of the discursive kind of um, implications of that and also kind of the, how we can measure that empirically. Um, so in public health, I always find myself being too theoretical for my environment and being, you know, thinking about research funding. Um, and then I think queer theory um, and kind of more of these, you know, social studies, humanities kind of environments. Um, I'm wondering, like, there seems to be kind of, um, I understand the need for pushing back against rationalism and positivism, but also I think at the same time it's really important to think about how we can fold in empiricism into our arguments. And this is where I think the idea of, um, I really like the idea of perceived risk and kind of transferring risk um, onto individuals piece to be couples and how they manage their lives is, you know, if we think about austerity and neoliberalism at large, we're thinking about kind of um, a shrinking state in a sense, and we're thinking of really the actual transfer of these um, of these responsibilities of risk management onto couples, and we saw that, and that's evidenced kind of medically with like prevalence and incidents um, as well. But thinking about the ways that, you know, kind of we can think about Foucault and power and also think about governmentality, but also thinking about what normativity looks like in a retracting economy and retracting state. And that's where kind of the public health comes from. So if you could just share your name and your affiliation and your question. We'd love to hear any comments, concerns. Yes? Um, I have a question. My name is Jessica and my affiliation is here to hear her speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I have um, a friend, and I can't remember your name. Jara. Can you say that? Jara. Jara. Mm -hmm. um, I have a very close friend who is South African, um, and her partner, who is male identified but has not transitioned, um, who is American, and I think, or you know, from the US. Um, and I think what's really interesting, and, and I would like to hear just kind of what you have read and research. Um, about this is the idea of using this kind of heteronormative structure for a potential advantage for immigration mm -hmm. and how, you know, if her partner is to go on hormones and actually make that legal transition, boom, she can get legal status in a second. And I'm curious if that has come up with you. Because they've chosen, he has chosen not to because he doesn't want to do that yet. Right. But if, you know, things don't get passed, he might do. Right. Like curious that the state would kind of like force a, yeah. a sort of identity transformation or something in order to fit their models. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that that is, it's interesting. I think when, you, when you're looking at um, the issue of binational couples, often trans-identified people are left out of that discussion <coughs> because of this assumption that they would be able to fit the heterosexual mm -hmm. model and be able to get rights. And sometimes that's true, but very often, like you're saying, it's mm -hmm. not. And so, I mean, I think ultimately, at a discursive kind of level on a broader, broader spectrum, there's a lot of people that are excluded by this discourse, mm -hmm. that, like this couple right here, you know, that wouldn't be represented by, by what the, the mainstream advocacy organizations are trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I mean, that, that, is, that is an issue, I think, when you're looking at queer migration more generally, too, not just in my national world. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jared, can you give a little bit more detail on um, what the pushback that you see in the particular case you mentioned of, um, of the uh, Ingar and the um, Lord Dunbar said the person's name, but what, what, what did you, you give more, um, flesh out a little bit more how you read the pushback and, and what they argued? Well, and so it's, uh, I, I'm not actually certain that she is pushing back here. I mean, I'm saying that she is showing how this particular inequality is, is 
also affecting all these other areas of our life. So I'm suggesting that perhaps we might be able to start from there to talk about the kind of connection of oppressions. Um, I think that's part of the problem with with, financial, with the advocacy for binational couples right now is that there is very much a kind of um, a splitting off, I guess, in a way, um, of, of couples who who are able to access these rights and who wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, and so when I talk to couples, like in my interviews, basically, um, I didn't really want to bring in like interview data to this, to this setting, but um, what I find is, is that often couples do use this rhetoric as a way to talk about all these other things that are going on. Like it's not just about the fact that they're not able to be together, it's about the fact that, you know, my partner has HIV or AIDS, I can't take care of them because I'm being deported. Um, my issue is that, you know, we have, I can't go see my family who's dying because I'm undocumented and can't leave the United States. I mean, there's all these, you know, work economic issues that are going on. And, and people really are, are seeing that, I think, when they look at the big picture, but then they kind of narrow it through this discourse that's been provided by, by kind of mainstream advocacy. Um, and so I, I'm not necessarily saying that that work is being done here. I'm saying that she starts to point to something that I think we could look at as maybe a method in which um, you could think about the broader politics or a more kind of comprehensive critique of the system. Because I think advocacy necessarily diverts, them, diverts people from doing that. I mean, it's more of a like, let us in, let us in, not this whole system is so constructed in a way to really you know, exclude a lot of people. But I think it's also, that's one of the reasons why I think looking at binational couples is interesting because there is a particular issue of legality there. You know, I mean, it's like a real thing. I, for someone who is undocumented, I do think it makes a big difference to have some sort of legal status for protection purposes, for economic reasons. There's a lot of things. And so, kind of trying to deal with that tension. Have a second question. I can, I can write it no, no, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what happens with that error that Fox News oh, okay. made. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> And when that error was recognized, what, what do you think happens in that uh, misrecognition? Yeah, I find it. I find it hard to believe that it was accidentally uh, published. So, so what happened was there was a. Uh, there was an article that went up on Fox News that was promoting um, a recent book that was published by an author named uh, Susan Venker. Um, and in her book, she's uh, trying to uh, critique, critique feminism, basically, in, in saying that women today are unhappy because they're not falling into like the role of the housewife, like the, the subordinate role. So this... <laughs> So it's a really heinous article, um, but that that image was published at the top of this, like before you got into the article, this was the feature image. And it, other than crediting AP, it, it didn't describe what the image was at all, and it stayed up there for three days. So then um, a blogger, blanking out her name right now, actually posted on Twitter saying, oh my gosh, this happened, and Fox immediately took it down. But before it was taken down, a bunch of different social media outlets sort of lifted this image and swept it all over the internet as this really crazy error. Yeah, so. The second part of your question. I was just wondering politically how yeah. you read that in terms of what does that say about um, I, I think, uh, politics and. and mm -hmm. Seeing and not seeing. Yeah, I, I sort of read it as probably someone on the inside did it as a political message to see what would happen. Uh, because even when you look up the image through AP, they're identified as a same-sex couple. This is a pretty famous photo. It was actually the first same-sex couple married at the top of the Empire State Building. So it got a lot of coverage um, when it happened. So I, I mean, I read it as someone on the inside trying to make a point. I don't necessarily know what the point is. Um, I mean, other than being in being in the system and promoting same-sex marriage, or seeing if same-sex marriage be read as something that reads up as a sex marriage. Yes. Sorry to have missed other panels, but I was talking about the city purchase, but I did catch uh, the first one. Uh, um, how familiar are you with North Star's backstory? 
A, a little bit. I've, okay. Because I'm not a I'm not a super comic freak, but I've I've read quite a bit about how he's he's actually been used as this character that the gay character. Yes, the gay character that promotes all of these gay issues. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he adopted a. Uh, gay baby, or no, no, he, he, <laughs> <laughs> he, adopted a, he adopted a baby, so he's the first gay character to adopt a baby, and the baby was HIV positive, I believe. Um, I, I know more, like, the okay. old history, like, North Star from, I don't know, there's any other comic there, but he was, like, a member of this Canadian superhero group. Yes. He just disbanded, of course, because he was Canadian superheroes. <laughs> but, um, Wolverine's the only Canadian superhero who really went mainstream. Okay. But, um, actually his... Like his backstory is one where he was a member of a terrorist organization, part of one of the radical Quebecois, he's because he's, he's French Canadian, he was a member of like a terrorist Quebecois separatist group um, before he renounces his you know, terrorist politics. So I would just, you know, it would be interesting if you were to yeah, pursue this to kind of go back, like what happens, you know, when the radical, you know, queer separatist, like the radical separatist becomes you know, gay married. Yeah, I know. Um, yes. He's an interesting character for that reason because he also jumps between several different comics. Like he doesn't start as Astonishing X Men. And, and no, he doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So he jumps around. Yeah. Thank you. My national couple movement held that up too. Like as a moment of like, look, we've got my national couples in, in yeah. a comic book. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. I mean, it wasn't just a gay marriage. Right. It was my national yeah. couple marriage. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um. So. Yeah. I'm Leah. My name's Leah. Um. I'm here at the school, but I'm. I also came here to educate myself more about queer nationalism and Palestinian solidarity, which is all stuff that I'm interested in, but like very new at. So I have a question for Kirk, just based on my like very beginner understanding of homo nationalism. Um, from what I've read, it seems like homo nationalism is almost this like promise that if you abide by these certain rules of like you know, homonormativity, like monogamy, like whatever, like desire at least to be married, um, you will win this sort of safety or inclusion. And so I think it's really interesting that in your study, these, um, the black couples still didn't feel that safety, e even the ones who were in like monogamous long-term relationships who were like going, like abiding by the rules, you know, of like, this um, this like accepted mode of um, assimilating, right? And so, if you could like maybe you could like bring that into your study in some way, but I think that's it was just something that I thought was interesting because from what I've heard, like homo nationalism is like this promise of safety, but who's excluded even if they follow the rules? Right. I mean, so. That's a really interesting question. I mean, this is where this this kind of conversation is going different directions. Uh, a lot of different directions. One of the ways that I think about it, I mean, thinking about homo nationalism and like kind of the production of um, like normative gay subjects that have legal parity that are X, Y, and Z. Um, a lot of kind of critical race theorists will tell you that the idea of citizenship, particularly for um, someone who is black for a black MSM, for a black gay man, is uh, kind of a farce. That what does citizenship mean? Like citizenship in the United States, particularly like considering um, slavery and like transatlantic slave trade, how can we conceive of citizenship for um, black MSM? So there's a way to think about that in terms of like the safety of a relationship, in terms of what it provides, and <clears throat> looking around like across socioeconomic context, of course, you can talk about like what does marriage do for a working class couple versus what I mean that's arguments and maybe it's like no it's like marriage isn't gonna autom automatically assume like all these privileges for people that don't have them access argument but also if you're thinking about homonormativity within a context of new liberalism you're thinking about the advancement of some gay bodies and kind of ex the exception of others I mean I'm really interested in the exception particularly we see that with our black and couples so part of what I'm trying to think about in terms of how does this make sense in terms of risk? Um, you know, the whole access argument is really interesting if we're talking about state surveillance because, um, back up, I'm thinking about, particularly for HIV, we're thinking about, there's a lot of, um, I'm starting to work on projects around PrEP. PrEP is kind of the taking of um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, so taking Truvada, basically every day to prevent HIV transmission. 
Um, so there's this argument, and this has been working within kind of the access kind of narrative. If more people have access to treatment, more access to care, more access to testing, HIV will be reduced. However, this article just came out of the Lancet a couple, like a month ago, they were showing that test and treat is actually, it's full blown in Western Europe, particularly United Kingdom, and it's not working. So kind of our models of how we kind of think about access within kind of the state framework seems to be limited. Um, and maybe perhaps we can learn from how we see these um, black men kind of internalizing and embodying risk versus mm -hmm. how white partners do. I don't know if that's an answer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all really interesting. I hope there's a clear-cut answer. Um, Again, it's kind of like a bag of cats. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of, like, queer friends of color who are just, like, I'm a separatist because, like, fuck it, the system isn't going to, like, give me any of the like, so. Right, but I mean, at the same time, the dyad for a lot of men across kind of socio, I mean, so it provides kind of subsistence, like, survival in terms of, like, sharing resources. And that's initially what I was looking at was kind of the sharing of resources. Um, and so there's positive and negative aspects of that. Yeah, and so, but we're seeing that at the same time, um, and perhaps it's kind of advancing our conceptions of what what risk looks like in terms of a couple, because we're seeing that transmission is primarily occurring, or the majority of transmission, I guess above 50%, is occurring within kind of primary partners and relationships. So is it because maybe relationships are, will not ever be monogamous and we need to reject kind of homogamous right. basically heteronormative conceptions of what a relationship looks like. Um, but then at the same time, that doesn't make sense for our data because we're seeing that these guys, I mean, right. is, this, there, is there like an exhaustion? Is there a fatigue that occurs? And people are like constantly told they're going to be HIV positive. And then, so in this couple, you have low risk, but then you leave the couple. I don't know. Right. There's also a return to thinking about structure, kind of the structural environment that really is a determinant of risk rather than kind of individual behavior. I have another question. Oh, thanks. Well, it's, oh, it's sort of on the heels of this because I think, and I came late, so I may have just missed some things, but I'm trying to reconstruct parts of your, the, the data part. Right. So that um, black MSN uh, are, in most of those in your study, tend to be more careful around safe sex practices non-black in this that means white or just Yeah, so we only looked at white and black relationships. So white men dating white men, white men dating black men. So they're more careful. Also, the rates of zero conversion between 06 and 09 have been high for black MSN or, and black MSN are also the ones more likely to express concern about risk. Mm -hmm. If they I mean, part of so with those three things, um, they kind of, there's there's one story that puts them together pretty easily. Um, the zero conversion is high, so we have to be careful and we're scared. That's one story that makes those things make sense. Um, but you brought in a kind of structural analysis, you know, about the context in which in which these things get made sense. And I what I guess I'm wondering if you could elaborate on is how you build up from what people say, what they think and what they say, and this more sort of structural context. The quotes that you projected, unlike your friends, Leah, don't say, screw it. They right. say, we've got to be really careful. Right. And so I'm curious about this, um, what sounds to me like a bit of a compression to go from what people say to this very broad structural analysis. And if you had to, if you had to do the knitting, um, so to speak, to get to get people's comments uh, uh, sort of in dialogue with the structural right. analysis without just it being a you know a lot of block metaphors. Correct. How would you argue? Well, so the all the statistics basically show that black MSM actually participate in the same, if not lower, risk behavior than white MSM. Right. So some people have argued for looking at kind of just basically thinking about sexual networks and possibly it's about kind of racialization and the acceptance of, um, the, like what I kind of I mentioned studies that found- To explain this lower risk practice? No, not to explain the lower risk practice. I kind of use the lower, the, the lower risk practice with the high risk perception to kind of evidence kind of the, this, this um, disproportionate embodiment of risk. And I, I see that as a product of kind of homonormalization 
with kind of thinking about black bodies as exceptions and not being advanced through that kind of normal. But the rates of seroconversion for MSM are still higher for black MSM. Right. If, if I were in no, so the rates for seroconversion are higher among black MSM and then it's right. Latino and then white are below us. But we're seeing higher risk behavior among white MSM, not a high perception of risk. Right. And generally kind of kind of some of our couples kind of were kind of blase about risk. Yeah. And um, you know, the, they would have unprotected sex pretty early on in the relationship and there wasn't so I'm kind of looking at risk as kind of this weight, kind of looking at risk as so it's a, a lens to think about. Um, there's a lot of a lot of research that shows that risk is essentially kind of really bad. Per perceptions of risk can be really bad for people with mental health. Um, but at the same time, for PrEP, for um, medical adherence, well, all the biomedicine people will, will argue and did yesterday in a meeting that you know high perception of risk is good. And the problem with HIV in men is that black men don't think they're risky. And this this data is saying that's the opposite. Yeah. It, it strikes me that if you think you're at risk. You know, for all the ways that that's hard on you, um, it, there's a, a kind of direct, potentially direct way to why you know, what you would do. Yeah, so I'm wondering how do we explore it's kind of... And you think you're at risk not just because life is hard, but because your rate of conversion Correct. have been high. So there's some, there's, there's, there's fear and recognition of the ways in which you know, the world is not going to take care of you if you get sick. Uh, but, and then there's also a kind of realism that comes from looking at the rate of seroconversion. And so, I, like, you seem to be really um, working uh, a broad explanation for something that seems pretty clear to me at a much, at a much more practical level. And that's part of what I... And so what the, I'm trying to understand. The, so like I, the practicalness is that this makes sense that there's a higher risk? No, not, yes, it makes sense there's sure. a higher risk because there's been a higher rate of zero conversion. Right. So even if your 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 practice is safe, that's not what protects you if there are still higher rates of zero conversion. Right. I'd be scared myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, and then we'll take yeah. you. I want to pick you back. Go ahead. Go ahead, Drew. Oh, yeah. Well, so, I mean, this is this is something that's still, like, there's we're, there's still not data for explaining why. I mean, perhaps we're kind of, I think there's a hyper-focusing on individual behavior. However, that's kind of, uh, again, it's kind of a um, personal responsibility. Who has to care about personal responsibility versus who doesn't? Um, so we're seeing that our white couples don't have to care about personal responsibility necessarily when it comes to HIV. But our black couples do. And do the white versus black couples assume that they're going to get taken care of if they get replaced? Well, so I don't know. And so what's is the care? And, and so <clears throat> we didn't explore that. That's actually something we're going to be exploring in terms of with a new ethnography we're going to call it. But it's going to be particularly about affecting black and some um, and kind of perceptions of risk and health. Um, but I, I guess I'm more interested in kind of looking at asking why and how to like how to understand um, how we got to this point where some couples don't necessarily some gay men some MSM don't need to worry about these risks and their behaviors are high um, and some men do and their behaviors tend to be low risk. So I'm just interested and in further ways to explore that and that calls for more empiricism and more observation and analysis. And there's nothing really in the literature to kind of say why this is happening other than what is accounting for this high perception. And I see what you're saying in terms of epidemiologically, obviously there's not a relationship between perception, um, perceived risk, and kind of uh, efficacy of rather behaviors. I think also this is a productive conversation. And I think it would be great to maybe even after the panel to continue it. But we'll take one final question and then we'll close. Just to kind of piggyback on that a little bit. Um, so I'm a therapist in that community. Um, there are two things that are being you know, brought up that is relevant. First of all, um, and I'm curious if you found this in your research, um, the idea of things in the black community, um, you know, the concept of the DL. And so many of these men having sex but not able to be out within their community. And so the risk of HIV in that area, I don't know, have you um, 
Um, so the research over the past few years has, has kind of refuted um, kind of questions around, I guess there's this access kind of, this is an access kind of narrative of those who are out identified as gay are more likely to get tested or more likely mm -hmm. to uptake um, parental behaviors and particularly in the black community, I mean, there's this whole DL myth is actually not true. And we don't, Although I've had patients. So I mean, so yeah, there are patients, but at yeah. the same time, I mean, I've had this conversation with a lot of providers mm -hmm. and um, when you, there's, I think it's really interesting how people reproduce that narrative to understand their diagnosis in terms of saying that this was because my husband was DL and gay. I mean, there's there's a whole kind of that really operates to kind of stigmatize and reinforce kind of ideas of homophobia within black communities, which again is another part product of like homo homonormative kind yeah. of conceptions around race. So I mean, that's, that's been disproven. Um, I mean, I still have had that of course. the therapist so yeah. I know in the room. And just the DL with first down Oh, on yes. the down yes. and yeah, people, I mean, and I'm sure that that is ever changing with, you know, the way that, you know, coming out and that being more accepted and all of that. Right. But I have to say, I have, I have. No, it does happen, but the, the fact that it's interesting, that it kind of reminds us of kind of, that might be interesting, but at the same time, MSM are the only ones to be, only group to consistently be incidences continuing to rise across over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was some statistics that showed that African-American women actually had an increase and yeah. non-white women yeah. had an increase, but those have actually gone down. And part of this is also the ways in which we measure mm -hmm. and we collect data. Yeah. Um, it's very much subject to kind of how we think about these things. I mean, I know I have a colleague at Columbia that actually produced a paper about the down low mm -hmm. and HIV. And so it kind of shows about how you know, ideology is operating to reinforce our beliefs um, or, uh, that are social conceptions, but yeah. that are, you know. Yeah, and, and then again, just to finish up with that, I think one of the things is that um, some of the younger patients that I have, um, because of the access to meds, because of the access to treatment, um, they kind of feel as though, oh, I can have unprotected sex because, hey, I have access to these meds that are going to make me live, you know, as long as I want, whereas my older patients are still, you know, they're afraid, and, and so I think it's interesting, the idea, you know, I know that you said the world is not going to take care, but then there's also this, oh, the world actually is going to take care. So just one sentence is this, this conversation in and of itself is a reproduction of neoliberal ideology, mm -hmm. or own personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. so I no, think I hear what that's you're saying. That's interesting in yeah. itself. So I think this conversation was really enriching for me. We have a therapist, we have someone in the public health world, we have academics, anthropologists from different fields, we have someone interested in visual culture, and we have um, all of you. So thank you so much for coming, for your questions, and to all of our panelists.